previously on Retro Hack Shack. So I found this clone PC the other day at an e-waste recycler and it's in pretty bad shape and that battery has started leaking. There was a lot of corruption on this MFM hard disk so much that I'm probably not going to be able to use it. In the last video, there were a number of chips on this motherboard that uh, were a little bit different or difficult to identify. One of them was this Willis chip, and when I did a Google search on the part number, it turned up absolutely nothing. However, looking at the schematic, I was able to find a different part number, and when I looked up that, it actually showed that this was a delay chip. So this delays signals, uh, and you can configure that just by hooking up to the different outputs of this chip, whether you want to delay for 20 milliseconds or um, 100 milliseconds. So that was pretty interesting. This looks like a, a more common chip than I first thought. People also suggested that I try to use SpinWrite to fix the hard drive. Now, it seems like there's a lot of errors on the hard drive, but I was game to try SpinWrite, and so I'll be showing that in a later part of the episode. Now, in the last episode, I used a newer BIOS to determine that there was a memory problem in the second bank of memory. And now that my replacement memory chips have arrived in the mail, I started just in the middle of this bank by putting a replacement memory chip in and then checking the BIOS to see if that fixed the problem or if the memory address had moved around. And sure enough, it did. This indicated that I got lucky in swapping these things around and fixed one of the bad RAM chips, but now there's another one that's bad as well. So after swapping a few more chips around, I found where that second bad RAM chip was. And when I booted up the system, now it reaches a full 640K of RAM, which is what should be in the system. So I marked those two chips as bad. And just for fun, I threw in the old BIOS chip to see if that would work now. And it did, it actually booted up without me having to move any of the jumpers around. So I guess this is just one of those cases where the message that I was getting from the BIOS of it only going to 128K was just an artifact of the way the BIOS was written. And uh, unfortunately it led me down a bad path of trying to figure out what was wrong with this memory. Now it's time to turn our attention to this uh, combo card, floppy controller, um, serial parallel game port and clock. Now, when I first took a look at this board and the additional uh, daughter uh, slot uh, that this had with the additional ports on it, I wasn't quite sure what the uh, blue looking port was. And of course, duh, that's a second COM port. And a lot of times these PCs came out with a nine pin COM port and a DB25 uh, COM port. So, I just did not, I think the, the blue color threw me off or something. I should have known because I've taken apart plenty of these that had two different COM ports on them and I just wasn't, uh, wasn't paying attention at that point, I guess. But when I took this out, I noticed that there's a COM2, a place for another chip here, another communications chip, and it says COM2 on it. So I'm not even really sure if that second COM port is actually working. It could be that this one chip has the capacity to drive multiple COM ports, but uh, it, well, I don't know why you would need more than two, and this obviously says COM2, so there's a chance that uh, that this second COM port wouldn't function anyway because it's missing the chip that's required to drive it. And I did some research and looked up these uh, chips. This is the communications chip up here that controls the, the COM port. This is, of course, over here, as you can guess by the proximity to this uh, slot connector here, is the floppy controller, and then down here, this is the clock chip. A pretty neat little card, actually, but I couldn't find, there's no branding on it, and I couldn't find who makes it, other than the fact that all of these chips are UMC chips. So this is a, probably a clone that came out and was picked up by different resellers and was just marketed as a uh, combination card, combination communications and I.O. card. Um, and of course, we have this battery here that needs to come off. It's a nickel probably nickel cadmium given the age here. It could be nickel metal hydride. I don't think so though. I think it's a nickel cadmium battery. And as we saw on the last episode, this battery is definitely starting to leak, although the card works. So first step is to take off this uh, leaky battery. 
So I'm not sure if you can uh, see this. I've got the battery off, and this side appears to be okay. Seems to be some flux residue there, maybe. But this side, that corrosion had already eaten off the top of that pad, this side of the, of the uh, pad. Look at the, uh, the underside. That one looks okay. So um, that's kind of hanging on at this point because it's not connected to the other side, but that might be okay to connect to. But yeah, this side, you can see a little bit of corrosion coming off this way and this way, but it doesn't look like it's gotten into the traces yet. So I'm just going to go ahead and wash this off with some vinegar to neutralize any acid that's left and give it a little brush with some IPA. And hopefully uh, there aren't any traces that were that were eaten underneath the uh, solder mask there. OK, so I've gone ahead and pulled off the uh, these two sockets here, and there are definitely some traces that have been eaten away. I can see this thick one here kind of tapers off right there. It should continue up here and go up here next to this U23 marker. So that one's pretty obvious. And then I can see some breaks here or potential breaks here in some traces that go right here. Everything else looks okay, but I'm going to go ahead and tone these out, the ones that I can tell that are obvious that they should be connected. I'll go ahead and tone those out, and then I'll make a note of which ones I may have to solder then I'll replace the clock chip back in. I'm not going to replace this socket since it was unpopulated anyway. Um, I'll leave that one out, but I'll definitely replace the, uh, the clock and then make my uh, bodge connections. And then we'll move on to putting the battery, uh, the new battery, the uh, CR2032, into place. Now, if you're trying to trace out some connections and you happen to be working with a two-layer board like this one, you can hold it up to a bright light and that'll give you a better view of the traces as they run along the circuit board. So to keep track of this, as I was testing, I went ahead and took a high-res photo of the board, and then I put in markers for where things should be connected and uh, where there could be issues. The reason I did this is because once you put these sockets back in and the ICs back in, it can be really hard to find out, wait a second, did that go here or there? I'm not sure. So it's just nice to have some documentation to go back to when you're trying to fix these. So it turns out after I did some more investigation, even though it looks like these traces are, are really bad and they may be marginal, but you know, electrically either it works or it doesn't. And right now only one of these traces was actually bad and it was um, a little bit uh, difficult to troubleshoot because it was bad right near the pad. The pad had worn off right there or part of the trace near the pad had worn off it's kind of difficult to see, but it was just that one in the end that I had to fix. So that was the good news. Went through a lot of work, but I believe that connection there is the ready pin on the chip. And the way that works is if I look at the data sheet, it says at the start of each read or write cycle, the ready line, which is open drain, will pull low and remain low until the data from the chip read appears on the bus or data on the bus is latched in during writing. So what I interpret that to mean is that, um, you know, this is going to go low, and then when uh, the read is done, it will go back to high again. But if it's not connected at all, then whatever on this card is doing the reading from the clock chip isn't going to know that that was successful or done. So I think that's pretty important that that was connected. I don't think it would have worked without that. It still may not work. I don't know. But at least I made an attempt to fix it. Okay, so at this point, I need to attach the battery. And the way the battery works is um, the nickel metal hydride, which I've already thrown away, the nickel met metal uh, cadmium or hydride batteries, what they do is, uh, uh, you know, they're very flexible because when, you, when those are in circuit, when there's power, the battery is charging up. When you disconnect power, they output the power to keep the uh, time data in the chip, in the memory active, so that you never lose that. So, and you don't really need a whole lot of special circuitry besides making sure the voltage is, is uh, at the right level in order to make that process work. So they just charge and they discharge, and that's about it. Now, of course, with these batteries, uh, the, the ones I'm going to be putting in, which is just a coin cell battery, those are not rechargeable batteries. So we have to prevent them from being charged up when the computer is turned on and power is applied. And the way that we're going to do that is with a diode. 
So we'll put a diode on the positive side of this connector, and that will essentially keep the uh, power from going into the battery, but it will still let power coming out because that's what a diode does. It prevents electricity from moving through the diode in one direction, but allows it to come out through the other. So I think what I'm going to do is fix this to the board, and that's one of the reasons why I left this socket out. Because now I think what I'm going to do is just take this resistor out and mount it to the back side of the board, and that will give me enough room to be able to mount this here with some tape. And then I'll just extend these uh, legs here. I'll extend these connections over to where they need to go on the board. I hope that makes sense, but I'm going to go ahead and do that now. Okay, so I've soldered my uh, diode in place. I've got this, um, it was easier for me to solder it uh, sticking up like this. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to push on this and fold it over so that it's flush with the card. But uh, I think if you look closely there, you can see, it's a little hard to see uh, without looking in the viewfinder, but I put that in with the stripe part that is the negative side facing the board. So um, when this tries to charge what used to be the uh, nickel cadmium battery, it won't be able to because it'll hit that diode and won't be able to charge anymore. It'll only allow it, the battery to discharge back into the board. There are, perhaps you can tell, a lot of uh, vias here and other uh, exposed pads where I took out the uh, uh, socket. So before I push that down, I'm just going to put a little bit of Kapton tape, which is insulating tape, down underneath there. And so when I push this down, there won't be any chance that I short anything out to the board. There we go. And now I can just put that down like that. And it should be good to go. It's pretty um, pretty tight. I'll have to be careful if I ever do have to change the battery on this. I'll just have to be really careful because if I pull the battery out, it might bend this back and eventually bend off those legs or break off those legs. But that should be just fine for now. It's time to test this card out. Uh, I've got it back in here got the uh, uh, floppy drive connected. Definitely want to test out the floppy drive because I could live without the serial ports. I could live without the clock, the real-time clock even. Um, but the floppy controller part of the card is really what I want to make sure is working and I didn't screw anything up when I was messing around with it. So anyway, let's just first do a power on test and see if it's working. Let me go ahead and stick a floppy disk in here and we'll just test to make sure that's still working. I assume it would have given me an error if it wasn't, but let's just try it and see. And directory returns just fine, so no issues there with the floppy drive. So that's good news. Floppy drive is still working. Okay, now on to the clock. So if you're used to DOS, the way DOS works, especially back in the old days, there was a date command and a time command, and that would uh, display the time and allow you to set the time. So if we do time, Okay, time is coming back as 12.01, because we just booted this up. So if we enter the new time, let's just say 8.34 p.m. So 08.34.00p. And if we do time again, okay, so right now it's remembering the time. I'll just do enter to keep that time. So right now it's remembering the time, but if I turn this off and turn it on again, all right, back to the C prompt. Let's just do time. And yeah, time is back to the default time, which is 12 a.m. So I think what we need to do there, I did find two utilities that are supposed to work with this particular uh, chip that I talked about before. Um, there is a set time and a get time. And I think there were multiples of these for various cards, but the ones that I downloaded uh, should work with this card, or at least that's what the website said. So let's try to do a set time, uh, sorry, set clock, set clock, I think. There we go. So now it's saying that the date is January 1st, 1980. Current time is 717. So let's just go ahead and update the date and time and see if it will remember it after we uh, do a, uh, uh, after we power cycle the machine. I don't know if this is Y2K compliant. So let's just do maybe 91, 1991 or 1981, just so it's the, at least the month and the day will be right. Okay, now let's do set clock again and see if it, 
see if it remembers. Okay, yep, May 20th, 1981, and the time looks right. So now let's go ahead and power cycle and see if we can get it to remember the day and time. Okay, now to get it to remember the time, you have to issue the other command, which is get clock. And that should pull in the current day and time. And there it is, the time that we set, May 20th, 1981, and it's 8.39 now. Now, to automate this so that it does it every time the computer boots up, we can edit the autoexec.back. And down here, where I've removed the line that actually called for the clock in my 5150, I can add in that command to call that command. Getclock.com and then save it. And now when we reboot, the last thing it should do is go ahead and call a get clock and tell us the uh, uh, current day and time. So after the last episode, when I mentioned that I probably was not going to be using this hard drive, a lot of people recommended that I try SpinWrite to see if I could do a low-level format and get it working again. So that's what I'm going to try now, but the reason I'm telling you this before I get started is because the MFM drive is going to be quite loud, so I apologize for the background noise. This is going to uh, be quite a lot louder than just running the PC as I have been without the hard drive spinning. So here we go. Okay, it recognizes the hard drive again. It does seem to take a while to get past this step. Now this is SpinWrite version 5. I just got the latest one I could. I saw 2, 3, and 5 out there, but I got 5, so we'll see if this works. While this is doing the RAM test, there's a reason why I kept this particular part of the video for last, and that is because everybody has told me that this, when I have to do a low-level format, that it could run all night. All night so it's like 9 o'clock now or something. I left this until the very last thing so that I could just get this going, and then if I need to, I'll just let it run continuously until, uh, until it gets done, I guess. Ooh, pretty. Graphic status display. Awesome. I like that little display thing going around. I don't know what that's supposed to be, but it's pretty cool. All right. Well, it's doing its thing. I think this is the part that's going to take a long time. So I am going to just let this run potentially all night and we'll see how it comes out. Well, unfortunately, with SpinWrite 5, I could only get about halfway through and then there was no more physical disk activity and the program would just kind of hang at this point. So I consulted with Adrian Black, and he recommended that I try SpinWrite 2 instead of SpinWrite 5. So I loaded up a copy of SpinWrite 2 and started again. It did kind of stall here in the middle, but that's just because that's where all the unrecoverable data was. Um, you can see the, uh, the capital U's and the small U's are uncorrectable data, and it takes a long time to scan those. But instead of... Uh, kind of locking up like the SpinWrite 5 did, SpinWrite 2, kept on chugging along and uh, took about 36 hours. And I was able to capture this at the very last moment as it was just finishing up after 36 hours. And you can see all of those uncorrectable tracks there. Um, that is what took so long. Um, but uh, yeah, it found all these and it will reformat those uh, due to a low level format and make them usable again. Okay, well, SpinWrite finally, finally finished up. Uh, that thing really ran all night, long. all night long. And not only did it run all night long for one night, but it ran all night long for two nights in a row. All night long. All night. All night. But at this point, I'm just going to do an F disk and get rid of this whole, uh, all the data, all the partition, the data that was on it. There's nothing really special. I've got most of it off, so I can still take a look at that later and see if there's anything worth showing. But um, I'm just going to go ahead and make sure this is a completely clean partition. So to do that, we're going to run fdisk. I'm going to go back into the uh, C drive and run fdisk, and we'll delete that partition. And now we'll go right back in and create a DOS partition on the same one, primary DOS partition. Dosh partition created, drive letters changed or added, hit escape. Now that should be done. Let's just go ahead and display it to make sure it's there, make sure there was no problems. It shouldn't be. It's just a partition uh, 
information, really. It's just the, the, the organizational information that's on the drive to uh, define the partition type. So that looks good. Let's go ahead and escape. And the key here, oh, we're gonna restart the system. But the key is gonna be whether I can do a format or not. We'll see how the format goes. Now we'll do format D colon. All data will be lost. Yes, proceed. And there it goes, it's done. Oh no, it's not done. I thought it was done. <laughs> okay, the format is done. Um, it says, uh, it took about maybe two minutes, uh, three minutes, so not that long. You can imagine if you put like a one gig drive in this thing, which I believe um, MS-DOS 5.0 will support like up to two gigs, if I'm remembering correctly, I might've gotten that wrong. Um, but anyway, with a much larger drive, you can imagine how long that would take. So it's asking me for a volume label. I'm just going to hit enter for none. And there we go. And it's reporting back actually right around 20 megs. So I guess all that space is available now. I'm, I'm surprised. I thought a lot of those uncorrectable tracks would come back as marked bad or something or not available. And I would end up with a lot less space available on the disk, but it does look like it's uh, nearly 20 megabytes in total. So that's great. In fact, I went ahead and went back and did a quick surface scan using Spinrite 2 again. And as you can see, all of the tracks are usable now and the total track count is the same as it was when it finished scanning originally. So nothing is missing. Okay, so I'm gonna be putting MS-DOS 5 on here. Um, these may look like original disks, but they're not. They're actually reproductions that I made. Of course, the images are available online and uh, I created these labels from scratch. Um, and if you're interested in how I did that and how I got them to look just like the original labels, uh, I'd be happy to do an episode where I talk about making reproduction labels and uh, getting all the fonts to match and all that kind of stuff. So if you wanna see that, leave a comment down below. Okay, so let's put in disk one. I've taken out the IDE to XT, whatever it's called, the compact flash hard drive, taking it out and uh, let's see what happens when we boot this up. Floppy is reading. Should boot into the DOS setup menu. Setup is determining your system configuration. There we go, welcome to setup. So we are off and running. Hopefully it detected the hard drive just fine. So let's go ahead and step through the install here. Almost done, 94%. And it's amazing, I don't know about you, when I go through the installation of DOS like this, you know, you're watching the, the files getting written below, which is amazing, it can even tell you. You know, there's so few files that go into this that it can actually tell you as it's writing each file. But uh, all those files, you know, just bring back a little bit of nostalgia. You know, when you're when you're reading those go by, it's like, oh yeah, FDisk, I remember using FDisk, or uh, disk copy, or ext to bin is going on now, join.exe, like I remember using some of those tools in DOS back in the day. So every time I do this, it brings back a little bit of nostalgia. Remove any floppies and press enter to start MS-DOS version five. Sounds good to me. Oh, it found they used the EGA driver, so it found the EGA. Interesting. A copy of EGA device driver is being installed. Cool. Well, let's just do a ver and make sure that we are running. Yep, MS-DOS 5.0. So everything looks like it's working now. I'm gonna go ahead and um, move some utilities and some games and things like that over to this hard disk. And then we'll be able to do one more test and finally see what this looks like um, uh, with some games. But before I do that, I need to turn my attention to that awful case. So this feels like it's been a long time coming, but here's that uh, case that had scuffs on all four sides and this tape here which is some of that white sticky tape, uh, foam tape stuff. This stuff's always kind of a pain to get off. And I'm gonna be trying a number of different uh, things on this particular case. Lighter fluid is one that was recommended to me. I'll talk more about that in a minute, but I'm just gonna put a little bit of this lighter fluid on this foam tape and let it soak in a little bit while I do some surface cleaning. And for that, I'm just gonna use some soap and water and uh, a soft cloth. And I'm just gonna go over the whole thing and see how clean I can get it with this first round. And as you can see, this first round uh, is actually working pretty good, just with the soap and water and a little bit of elbow grease. There, It's hard to tell on camera, but there's still a lot of scuffs and scratches and uh, black marks all over the place. So I'm gonna have to work some more on that with some 
tougher chemicals. For some of these uh, rubbery or perhaps plasticky scuff marks that I don't think have gone through to the metal, uh, I'm going to be trying a number of things. The problem with this uh, case is that it's painted metal. So it's not like you can scrub plastic, like PLA plastic, where you can kind of be a little bit more abrasive and, and scrub you know, some of those spots and stains that are really ground into the plastic, especially textured plastic. You can kind of be a little bit more forceful with that. With painted metal, the, uh, the amount of paint on here is very thin. And so abrasives will take this off. And also um, I found that uh, isopropyl alcohol and even Goo Gone or um, citrus oil can take off this paint. Famously, I did that to my TRS-80 Color Computer Model 1. And um, I've done it to my, even my 5150 had a spot where the rubber uh, uh, legs or the rubber feet on the bottom of the monitor had left stains and I, I went to try to get those off and it actually took off the paint and left a little bit of bare metal. So I'm trying to avoid that. So to, in order to avoid that, I'm gonna try a series of things here and see if I can see what works best on these uh, rubbery, gooey streaks that have been left on here that aren't coming off with soap and water. So I've been, these two have been recommended to me, WD-40 and this uh, Ronsonol uh, lighter fluid. And that's what I tried to get off the sticker with. It did come off, but I don't think this actually helped too much. But we'll see about some of these scuff marks. And then I actually just have regular old cooking oil as well. So I'm gonna try all three of those on different uh, areas of one of these streaks and we'll see which one works best. If none of those works, then I'll move on to the very mild abrasives like a rubber eraser, a uh, latex-free soft rubber eraser, or uh, Mr. Clean Magic Eraser, which isn't really magic, it's just a light abrasive. Um, and then if those don't work, I'll try something a little bit heavier, maybe the Goo Gone or the isopropyl alcohol in very, very small quantities and see if that'll take off those stains. So to test this, I'm gonna apply a small amount of each one to this long scuff mark here, because I'm pretty sure that's the same material. Whatever scuffed this is the same all the way through. So I'll spray just a little bit of WD-40, a little bit of the uh, Ronsonol, Ronsonol? Yep and a little bit of the cooking oil. And then I'll come back after about 10 minutes and see which one, if any of them, uh, take off this either plastic or rubber uh, streak scuff mark. Okay, so it's been 10 minutes. I'm not sure if you can see this or not, but there's still some WD-40 here um, this area is where the lighter fluid went and that is completely evaporated. It's completely gone. So I may have to put some extra on there. And then the oil, of course, is still sitting there. So let's go ahead and try to work on that scuff and see if any of these make a dent in it. Okay, so here's the WD-40. That actually got quite a bit up, actually. That might work pretty well. And here's the oil. Let's see if the oil gets any of it up. Yeah, look at that. So actually, in this case, it looks like the oil did the best job, just the over-the-counter oil. So I'm gonna try oil. Well, let, let me do the lighter, lighter fluid first, just to make sure. Just for this to be a fair test, put a little bit more lighter fluid on. Just a few woo, drops. That really comes out of there. Gotta be careful. And now let's just see if the lighter fluid actually takes up anything. Ooh. Look at that. Wow. Okay. I think we have a clear winner here. So the lighter fluid actually took off all of it and it doesn't look like it hurt the paint at all. So I used the lighter fluid and got most of the scuffs off, uh, obviously being careful and since this is lighter fluid after all, you don't wanna use this around any open flame. And there was just a few areas where I did need to break out the magic eraser, um, just a few stubborn places where I couldn't quite get everything off, but I was very careful and uh, ended up not removing any paint. 
After that, it was time to turn my attention to the plastic front of the case. And for that, it was the usual suspects, a magic eraser, a little uh, isopropyl alcohol, and a whole lot of scrubbing to get all of those scuffs off that plastic. So just a reminder, here's what that case looked like when I brought it home. Full of scuff marks, scratched, black stuff, and some really icky gooey stuff on the side along with that yucky sticker. And here's what it looks like now. As you can probably tell, there's a few uh, really deep physical scratches that I couldn't get off the side here, but otherwise all that dirt, grime, scuffs, tape, everything is removed and this thing looks like a million bucks. It really does. It surprised me how clean it actually came, um, especially this side over here, which seemed to, after I got that tape off, seemed to clean up really nicely. So there's quite a shine to it and uh, all of that black gunk is now gone. Of course, it is missing one thing, and that is a case badge. This one didn't come with it for whatever reason, but I think that's something we can rectify. So I got out Inkscape, created a new logo, and now this thing has my own personal mark on it. I think that's much better, don't you? Well, now it's time to test out uh, the performance of this machine, as well as a few games, just to make sure everything's running okay. Uh, I had hoped to hook my EGA monitor back up my 5154 from IBM. Uh, however, when I turned it on, there was no high voltage. And now when I turn it on, I get nothing. So unfortunately, I feel like there's probably some more power issues that I have to troubleshoot. Uh, if you want to watch my video where I did the initial troubleshooting and got it working again, it was quite a long process. Uh, I will link that up above. It looks like there's going to be a part two to that episode, though, <laughs> because it's not working again. So anyway, we're stuck with this uh, flat screen monitor, but uh, at least by using the um, RGB to HDMI device that I showed off before, uh, everything is pixel perfect and in the right proportions. It's not stretched out, even though it's running HDMI. So quite a higher resolution, but it looks even better than it did back in the day. So let's go ahead and test some of the performance of this machine and make sure that's running correctly. So I installed Check It. And it does identify the BIOS as DTK Urso. So that's pretty interesting because, um, you know, I didn't really see that before on this when I was playing around with it. So uh, somehow it's able to recognize the BIOS. Perhaps that's written in somewhere where it's easily detectable. So let's just go ahead and fire up the main system benchmarks. And it's not going to find a coprocessor, of course. It's trying to, but it's not going to. But you can see we have PC XT speeds, which is exactly what this is, an XT clone and uh, it's detecting that we have EGA video adapter. So, uh, so far, so good. Okay, now I was able to save some of the games that were on the original hard drive here. So I've loaded those back in and I thought we could just try a few. It's interesting because they have, uh, looks like they have copies of uh, auto exec, auto menu, things like that, that they were probably messing with to get some of these games to work. Um, but there's a, you know, a series of games here. Some of them look pretty interesting. First one I see is, um, Kong. So let's go ahead and load up Kong. And I may have to switch into CGA mode if that game doesn't support EGA. So let's just try Kong and see what happens. Yeah, that doesn't like EGA. Let's switch back over to CGA. Here we go. That looks a little bit better. So this is David's Kong. Press any key to continue. Let's see what happens. Object of the game is to avoid the oil barrels. So it's explaining how to play Donkey Kong, apparently. I think I can figure that out. Enter a number from one to five to begin the game. Let's try three. Ooh, wow. This is pretty primitive here. Oh, was this programmed in basic? No, I don't think so. Oh, this is painful. I wonder, did someone create this game? Maybe if you know, if you've seen this game before, uh, well, let me know. It's definitely not smooth. I'm going to try jumping a barrel. Oh, it does. Oh, it does have some sound. Play again. Yes or no. Let's try one more time. So I don't know if it was this an actual game or is this something that somebody programmed from scratch? I have no idea. Let's try fast this time. Oh, holy crap. That is fast. So let's see if I can get up to the princess this time.
Nope. Okay, well this is just awful. So I am going to quit this and uh, play something else. Okay, so as you can see, this is a game called Pac-Man. Pac-Man with a K. Uh, it does have some music, but it seems very similar to the Kong game that we were pl I was playing before. Let's just see how this plays. Oh, it's very clunky. I have a feeling this is just the way the game was written. I don't think this is the fault of the computer or anything that I did when fixing it. I think this is just a poorly written game. This is very painful. Let's try playing something that supports EGA graphics. All right, so let's try out a little Arkanoid and see if that works. And we'll choose EGA graphics. And we'll choose keyboard, and we'll blur out a little bad word there. All right, looking good. Should hear some sound here in a minute. Yep. Sound is working. Looks great. That PC uh, speakers had seen better days, though. <laughs> All right, let's see if there's any delay here. It doesn't look like it. Yeah, it looks like it's playing pretty well for keyboard. I, it's hard to play with the keyboard, actually. But you can do it. Whoops. I guess I can't, though. Okay, okay. Anyway, Arkanoid's playing, and it's looking great. And one last, let's try out Alley Cat. Yeah, looks fine. Do you want to use a joystick? Unfortunately, no, not right now. Let's play as a kitten. I love this. Escape puts the game into pause mode. Get it? Pause mode. <laughs> This game's a little harder with the keyboard. Oh, I jumped over the fence. Oh well, I got a couple mice. Well, the machine's definitely working. Uh, I don't really see a need to test it too much further. It's working as expected. Hard drive's working, memory's fixed. Uh, we got the, uh, uh, that battery on the real-time clock is working now and the time is, the real-time clock is working. So yeah, it's just nice to see this come back to life and work the same way it did when someone bought it, uh, 37, or oh, 33 years ago or so. So it's working great. And I think this was a great success. All right, well, I have to admit, I'm a little bit surprised that everything actually worked out in that repair process. Um, but if you're just starting out, remember, you can do it. Just go ahead and try. Uh, make sure you do your research. Watch a lot of YouTube videos, not just mine, but other people's as well. And uh, you'll learn a lot of tips. That's the way I've done it, is I've used some information and technical know-how that I've already had. And then I built upon that by watching YouTube videos, reading blogs, learning about these systems. And you can do it too. So uh, if you've ever been tempted to pick up an old system like this and try to repair it and get it working again, go for it. So these blogs and videos and everything, this is part of the retro community. And in that regard, I just want to say the community has been so great. Uh, all the well wishes that have come in. Thank you so much. Not just that, but comments about uh, the, the quality of my videos or how great the content is or people offering suggestions like that lighter fluid uh, suggestion that I got in one of the comments to the videos. So I just want to say thank you to the community. This is probably one of the best experiences I've had from an online community perspective in quite a while. Everyone out there is great. We all just love this technology and want to work on it and see it working. And uh, it's really great how the community has come together, especially in light of the past 18 months or so and what we've been through uh, with the uh, human malware and everything else. Hi, Penny. You want to say hello? Um, 
But that's going to wrap it up for this one. If you like this video, go ahead and like it. If you're new to the channel, hit the subscribe button. That really helps spread the word and uh, keep the channel growing. And uh, you can go the extra step and become a patron on my Patreon page as well. I would really appreciate it. I've got some new stuff I've got to buy, but I'm holding off until I've got enough funds. I'm not going to sink myself into debt over a YouTube channel. So with that, hello, Penny. <laughs> I was just about to say goodbye. Anyway, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. If you want to support me on Patreon, you can go to patreon.com slash RetroHackShack and sign up 